Welcome to the Big Unlock Podcast, your leading source of info for insights and best practices in digital health and digital transformation. Join host Patty Padmanabhan, CEO of Demo Consulting and co-author of Healthcare Digital Transformation, How Technology, Consumerism, and Pandemic are Accelerating the Future, in conversation with leading practitioners of healthcare and technology. Hello again, and welcome back to this episode of the Big Unlock Podcast. My special guest today is Lee Kim, Senior Principal of Cybersecurity and Privacy at HEMS. HIMSS has just recently published a fascinating report on the state of cybersecurity, which is their annual survey. And Lee and I unpacked the findings of the survey. But more importantly, we also talk about the new threat that has emerged in the wake of the Ukraine crisis and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And Lee shares her thoughts and observations on what she is hearing from the membership at HEMS and what healthcare organizations are doing to stay prepared. Well, let's get into the conversation. And before we go there, I want to take a minute to acknowledge the generous sponsorship of our partners, Be Well. I am here with Lee Kim, Senior Principal, Cybersecurity and Privacy at HEMS. Lee, thank you for sitting aside the time and welcome to the show. Thank you. So Lee, why don't we start with this? I read that the American Hospital Association has recently issued an advisory for hospitals to be on high alert for possible cybersecurity incidents, including ransomware. So could we maybe start? What what are you hearing from uh, your membership at HIMSS about that? And what what have you learned so far? Have there been any incidents? Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So our membership is obviously very concerned about what's happening with the current geopolitical conflict And, of course, it's safe to say that in any given day, there's literally an onslaught of ransomware attempts, phishing attacks, and everything else. But really what troubles our stakeholders is, of course, when you're dealing with a nation-state actor or, in some contexts, non-state actors as well, there's a great degree of sophistication. So the time horizon that you're dealing with is much more compressed than regular actors, much more sophisticated, much more obfuscation in terms of detecting that kind of intrusion into systems and networks. So yes, that's absolutely a a concern. But one thing that's true of many healthcare organizations is that many IT security departments and at at various types of healthcare organizations run fairly lean. So as a result, of course, this is a concern, and it's good to know what to focus on. For example, the HC3 at U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and DHS CISA and others is certainly shared across threat information, which may be of interest regarding destructive malware and otherwise And having those threat indicators is certainly a very good thing to have just in case. But it's safe to say that there are so many different threats that are happening and, frankly, a lot of vulnerabilities that healthcare organizations have in terms of their IT systems and applications that certainly the best and most direct way for all healthcare organizations to be prepared is to prioritize, of course, where their biggest weaknesses are tackle those, and then to the extent that other things can be addressed in turn based upon priority, that needs to be done. So, you know, obviously, as we always say, the best kind of intelligence is direct intelligence sharing with your peers and also within your organization in terms of what's happening in terms of these cyber threat indicators and phishing as well. Is HIMSS planning to issue or has issued any kind of an advisory within its own membership? Are you planning to do that? In terms of what HIMSS is doing, our efforts include but aren't limited to information sharing within trusted circles of stakeholders, which include but is not limited to providers. So there are different units of HIMSS that are certainly doing their part in terms of getting the word out in regard to what's being shared, including DHS CISA and also HHS and others. And so I think the 
key is to, you know, be a convener and also to be part of that pipeline in terms of information sharing, as it were, within our trusted circles of membership. Thank you for sharing that. Now, Hims has just recently published your annual report, I think, based on your survey of uh, cybersecurity, the state of cybersecurity in healthcare. And the report has just come out. I read it. It's fascinating. Can you walk us through the big highlights of the uh, report? And then we'll unpack some of that as part of this conversation. Absolutely. Thanks, Patty. So some of the highlights to the survey include things such as, I would say, things that are already known Um, such as the state of cybersecurity across healthcare organizations. We know from the headlines that phishing and ransomware are king in terms of incidents and intrusions that actually happen. But one of the ways in which our report digs a little bit deeper, I believe, is that we test assumptions. I mean, certainly we can glean from these reports that perhaps there are some kinds of systemic weaknesses across many healthcare organizations, and perhaps the security controls aren't as robust. But I have to say that one of the questions, key questions we've had when we were developing the survey are things such as, number one, is that true? And how is it true? Because it's one way to perpetuate assumptions without actual evidence. But in this case, we have actual evidence as to what providers are doing at a granular level, such as but not including security controls. We see we, you know, and certainly for myself working on the technical side for healthcare organizations, I've certainly seen many organizations that are slow to patch, but we actually have discrete specific information in terms of how much time it takes to patch given certain perceived levels of vulnerabilities that healthcare organizations may have. So I'd say that direct intelligence, just like with anything else, the more specific your information, I would say the more actionable the intelligence is so that healthcare organizations can take greater steps to reach higher levels of maturity and reach greater levels in terms of their action plan, in terms of maturing their programs. Were there any big surprises, any big changes from the previous year's survey that caught your eye? Yes, I would say that it was definitely unexpected to see increased funding in terms of cybersecurity, especially during COVID-19, which, by the way, we're still in. That may seem like an obvious point now, but as time goes by, this will be a part of history now. And so I think it's important to point that out that Just last year, we've seen many healthcare organizations, unfortunately, have to cancel things like elective surgeries and turn patients away because of how severe the COVID-19 pandemic was. And it's still a significant concern, of course, but it certainly was a surprise to me to see greater funding in spite of various revenue sources being a shortfall, essentially, to be totally frank. But I would say that that certainly was very, very much good news to see because that signals, at least to me, that cybersecurity programs may be more of a business priority for many organizations. And in fact, you know, as we look at globally what's happening throughout the world and, you know, not just simply with the U.S., is I think that it's really important for us in cybersecurity to also understand what's happening in other countries. We see that whether it's smaller healthcare organizations in the U.S. or countries that perhaps don't have the electronic health IT infrastructure like we have, these countries that are less developed in terms of us, in terms of technology, or what we see here in terms of organizations that are less developed in terms of health IT, they've been forced to adopt electronic health IT means for keeping track of what's happening in terms of COVID in their countries and healthcare and treatments and all those related things. So it's safe to say that cybersecurity has raised its profile as a result of a greater dependence on electronic information, which is forced by the circumstances of our pandemic. And so I would say it's certainly a positive inflection point for us in industry. 
So it's certainly good news that uh, investment levels are going up in cybersecurity. Is it because cyber criminals are getting smarter and are becoming more sophisticated and therefore you need to throw more money at the problem to stay one step ahead of them? Or is it because you were underinvested to begin with and this is just catch up? I'd say both. I mean, if we, to your second point, which is, you know, very well informed, of course, and a great observation, the health IT sector, look, our first publicized nation state cyber attack was about 2013, almost 10 years ago. And now it's 2022. So we've certainly had a quote unquote catch up period for that time period in the past decade. Whereas if we look at the more mature sectors, or at least as as is perceived, such as the chemical industry, critical manufacturing, electrical, and others, we've seen that they've had decades to bolster their security practices. So as they have turned to more electronic information, they've followed mature security protocols in place. So they've already had a playback book of sorts that's been tested. They already have disaster preparedness against natural disasters and man-made, IT or otherwise. Whereas we, of course, you know, we are doing very much catch up in the last decade. But it's safe to say that the pandemic and other things have certainly accelerated our progress and I think that cyber criminal activity absolutely cannot be ignored by any organization. We see the rising costs of cyber crime, and we've seen the rising costs of, you know, other things related to that, such as, you know, the cost dealing with mitigation if you are breached. And I think many organizations have concluded that regardless of whether we have ha- already had an attack or whether we have yet to have one, it is absolutely inevitable it will absolutely happen. And I think no one wants to be in the headlines anew or no one wants to be in the headlines again. And so as a result, I think that we really are focusing a lot more in terms of proactive measures. But I have to say, looking at in depth the questions, for example, surrounding the degree to which basic security controls are implemented, we really should, as an industry, be implementing the most basic security controls a lot more, whether it's encryption or identity and access management or even firewalls and antivirus. I mean, look, the internet has been a booming thing for the past 25 plus years. Shouldn't we be on board in terms of at least antivirus and firewalls if that technology has been around and if the price point for that and the price point for encryption solutions and otherwise has lowered as a result of, you know, all that innovation and development and the multiplication of offerings that are out there, I think the answer is absolutely yes. So I think that we are really reaching the point where we can't afford to be unprotected because regardless of whether our sector is specifically targeted or regardless of whether there's a side channel attack, let's say, as to another sector. We are incredibly vulnerable because healthcare is prone to attack even if one of our suppliers or one of the other sectors upon which we depend, such as water or electrical or manufacturing or telecom, if that's impacted, so are we. I mean, We are so very vulnerable in that sense in terms of critical infrastructure dependencies. Look at the the, uh, National Infrastructure Protection Plan, the NIP. It clearly spells out all the sectors upon which we depend. And I think that, you know, if, if people aren't paying attention now, they will unfortunately experience the bite of a cyber attack and they would have to rethink their strategy, unfortunately. Let's take a quick break, and I'd like to acknowledge our partners and sponsors, Be Well. And if you like this podcast, rate us on whatever favorite podcast platform you're listening on. And if you're interested in listening to the archives, visit us at thebigunlock.com. With that, back to the conversation. I think you make a really good point about the interconnectedness of infrastructure between healthcare and other parts of the economy. And we've also seen that a lot of the incidents uh, in the past few years have actually been attributed to business associates as opposed to the uh, covered entities themselves. And so your vulnerability spreads far and wide. And I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. 
But I want to go back to one of the headlines of the report, which is that fishing is still king. I think that's those are the exact words from the from the survey report. So fishing is still king. What are they fishing for? What kind of you know has anything changed uh, about in, in terms of what they're looking for, or is it the same kind of data that remains vulnerable? Right. Well, it's safe to say that in terms of what they're looking for, I think that needs to be traced back to what's the motivation for the attack, right? So, for example, if I were a healthcare organization with a nearby military base or some kind of defense operations, I may be, hypothetically, that is, targeting people that have access to that information. So that would be different from, for example, if a diplomat or someone of, you know, similar high status were treated at a hospital, their information may be targeted based upon that. So it truly depends upon the purpose of the attack. It's so often assumed that the end game for an attack is always the same, but we have to look at who's attacking which entity and for what purpose before we can make that determination. And whether it's because of different geopolitical tensions that are happening or whether it's because of who may actually be presently treated at your healthcare organization, you know, that of course can vary greatly and safe to say that organizations that are in those special situations are smart and they are layering their defenses and strategy to uh, account for that. On the other hand, as we saw from the survey as well, money, unfortunately, (laughs) it tends to be the number one goal of many attackers, whether they're nation state, non-state actors, or cyber criminals, or the quote unquote kid next door. So as a result, the purse strings that accounts payable person may have, or frankly, the extent to which a highly compensated employee may be targeted through a phishing website that may look like the payment portal, and let's say unwittingly they fall for a phishing attempt and their paycheck is diverted. We've seen those attacks on providers in previous years. And the way attackers work, as we've seen, is... If there's a some kind of tactic that's worked in the past, whether it's for healthcare or another sector, the attackers know how to be efficient with their time, and so they will deploy that attack just the same if that works across other sectors or, or if that's in particular worked with that specific organization. And they'll deploy it because even for them, time is money. So they want the most efficient type of attack that has the greatest impact that will achieve whatever their end game is. It could be money or if it's, for example, something uh, more nefarious, such as disrupting business operations or even clinical operations, then it can be that and that attack is given with that kind of purpose. So phishing can carry with it many other things, whether it's stealing credentials, stealing sensitive information, patient information or otherwise, or information on uh, COVID-19 treatments or research or vaccines or fish the yeah. gateway. To yeah. yeah, I've heard this before that uh, healthcare is relatively easy to be subjected to an attack because of historical reasons. And there is a certain amount of cost benefit involved here. Isn't it? There's a certain cost to being successful with an attack. And there's a certain benefit to the information that you're going to get access to that can be sold in the secondary markets or in the black markets. So is there a pecking order in terms of where cyber criminals like to target their attention? And uh, is healthcare high up in that pecking order? Are we a preferred target for them simply because of the ease of attack and the, and the potential returns for that? I don't know if the question makes sense to you, but you know, if I had 10 different targets to go after, would I go after healthcare because it's easy to do and the returns are going to be quick and high. Sure. Well, as I said previously, certainly healthcare itself can be an attack if, uh, let's say, specific patients, their information is targeted or whatever. But I have to say that in terms of sectors and the ease of attack, I think it's a bit of a myth that healthcare is easier to compromise than other sectors, whether one is targeting government entities or whether one's targeting other industries or critical infrastructure sectors. I think that there are others like healthcare that are easy to attack. I think that even within the financial sector, there are certainly entities that 
are not fully information sharing within their organization that perhaps are not deploying security awareness across all personnel, so their rates for successful phishing attacks may be quite high. So I have to say that I've heard that phrase before, and to some extent it's true because many healthcare organizations have just hired their CISOs in the past five or 10 years, et cetera. But then again, there are some cybersecurity professionals within healthcare that have been working at their organizations and that have you know, really skilled backgrounds that have been, you know, at the helm for 25 years. So I can assure you that some of those organizations are very tough to break in. But if you look at the asymmetry of it all, you know, defense people, you know, defenders on the provider side need to be right 100% of the time. Someone on the offensive side needs to be right just once. So, you know, there yeah, is, that's where, there is yeah, difference. you just have to be right once. Yeah, that's right. So, One of the things that I said I would come back to was uh, the question of business associates. Now, we are in an era of digital transformation. There's an increasing number of digital health partners. A lot of them are startups that are not necessarily well set up to provide all the information security protections that you need. And uh, for a variety of reasons, they don't know, they're not adequately funded, it's not high on their priorities, you know, pick whatever reason. But what is the risk now that healthcare organizations are taking by choosing to partner with an increasing number of innovative startups and looking for innovation in the first place? But then, you know, is there something that we should be concerned about from a robustness of uh, security protections and data protections in particular? Right. So that's, I think, an interesting perspective. Just to give a little bit of background on this, Patty, for context, we've seen ever since at least January 2014, these supply chain style of attacks whereby a a vendor or a business associate has been compromised to essentially compromise the the target, whether it's a big hospital or, you know, whomever is at the other end that's receiving those services. So with that in mind, I think that it's fair to say that as a general rule, the small and medium companies and the startups may be weaker in terms of their security defenses compared with the larger organizations. That's not always so given, you know, like we had just mentioned, and as you're well aware, the asymmetric difference between the attacker's perspective versus the person on the defense and how the person on the defense needs to be always right. But notwithstanding that, startups, from what I've seen personally working with them throughout the years, I think just like many other smaller organizations, they tend to themselves at times outsource uh, various tasks, whether it's development or cloud services or otherwise. If there's one weakness that I've seen, and again, not all startups are the same, so you know, obviously there's no 100% in, any, in anything, but what I've seen oftentimes with these smaller companies is that they just assume that by partnering with another entity or partnering with another individual that it's that other guy's or other entity's responsibility. So they may be less vigilant. And what's more, the degree of vetting from a due diligence perspective, I mean, personally, as a, the, you know, I'm a, I'm an attorney as well. Personally, I would always say to anyone, look, you really need to carefully select and vet with whom you're dealing with from a business perspective technical perspective and all else. Otherwise, how do you know how secure an entity is or whether they'll be around and or how robust the solution is? You don't know. So that's why I have to say, just because they're new and very innovative and perhaps very cutting edge, it doesn't shortcut the need for really doing your due diligence and seeing who their partners are as well and to see what information they'll get access to and who else may be involved because there are various factors, including insider threat as to who has access to their accounts and machines and systems and also any kind of breaches or incidents they may have. Yeah. In fact, it takes me to the final topic that I wanted to explore with you, which is we are right now in the midst of a big shortage of workers at all levels, including tech workers. So if, on the one hand, you can't spend 
enough money to get the talent that you need because the talent is not available. They're just not there for whatever reason. And I was reading an article uh, in the Wall Street Journal this, that there are 300,000 tech jobs that are open as of January. And uh, everything that I see anecdotally seems to indicate that at all levels, whether you're you know, a healthcare organization or a technology vendor or a vendor to a vendor, you're facing the same problem. And so you can't outsource your problem away. And is this a bigger concern now in cybersecurity is from what you're seeing, is there a bigger shortage in cybersecurity workers relative to other parts of the tech sector? Or is it the same as everywhere else? And, and if so, what's the solution here? Is it more automation? What are organizations doing to overcome this? How are they approaching this to make sure that they're putting in not only the adequate investments, but they have enough people to man the stations, if you will? Right, exactly. So in terms of workforce development and having that pipeline, it's safe to say that in healthcare, many healthcare organizations like to hire cybersecurity professionals that have had previous healthcare experience. Why? Because you can't simply ping a medical device, for example, and expect to for, for everything to be okay. For example, it could be knocked offline with that. You can't, for example, if you see malware going into a HVAC device or otherwise or some kind of potential trouble, you can't necessarily close off ports to live devices that directly impact patient care. You need to be careful with that, especially where patient safety and the care of patients is directly connected, right? So those are special reasons actually why healthcare cybersecurity security pros do have, you know, interestingly, a specific body of knowledge that people from other sectors, such as finance or manufacturing or chemical may not have, I mean, or even government for that matter, because if their emphasis is on confidentiality and locking up secrets, so to speak, our emphasis really above anything is ensuring that information is made available as well as it has integrity so that we could rely upon that data. So that reality is quite different. But in terms of some proactive measures that some healthcare organizations are actually doing, Patty, they are, you know, doing things that are quite innovative within their own organizations. For example, some People in informatics, as an example, may be trained up to assist with IT security duties. So training from within is definitely a great thing because they're familiar with the organization. They are committed to the organization. They find value in terms of what they're doing. And even with new individuals that are coming up from colleges and and high schools and otherwise, those that have certified cybersecurity credentials, such as certifications that we all know about, or those that, let's say, may graduate from a two- or four-year college with accreditation in terms of their cybersecurity degree that we know of some of these programs. I think that those things are, are prized. And once, for example, a student has that potential as recognized by, by a healthcare organization to train, there are some healthcare organizations that have taken on these students as interns and, you know, essentially nurtured them so that they become familiar with the healthcare environment so that they can continue to grow that way. So to the extent that, for example, we may not be able to afford the salaries of more mature sectors in terms of cyber, I'd say one way to combat that really is in terms of hiring students or people with less experience and or training people from within, because I think that there's a renewed interest in terms of cyber. You know, let's say people are considering expanding their role responsibilities or people are expanding, let's say, even wanting to delve into tech. Cyber is such a great field to be involved in. You're always learning and we're trained to think in ways that people generally don't. We look at things from the reverse way, such as how can something be attacked or breached, which is kind of the reverse of what many people believe in terms of 
having a half glass full approach of everything's fine. We look at, okay, what's not fine? (laughs) It's an interesting dynamic, but those are a few of the promising trends. Those are very useful, actually. I think uh, those who are listening to this and who are in the uh, information security space, I think we'll pick up a lot of tips from uh, your observations. We're going to have to leave it there today, but it was a fascinating conversation. And thank you so much for setting aside to come on the show and all the very best to you. Thank you, Patty. And likewise, and uh, hope to see you again. And it was really a pleasure. Once again, I'd like to thank our partners, BeWell, for their sponsorship and their support. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. We invite you to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, The Healthcare Digital Transformation Leader. Write to us at info at with your feedback and questions. 